and we will be off and running. All right. Well, everyone, thanks for joining us. As you know, tonight is lesson number six, which is crazy. It just doesn't seem possible that it's already uh, time for us to be finished, but that is uh, where we're at, believe it or not. And uh, this is going to be our last session. We will pick back up. We will uh, be waiting all uh, summer long to get back together. But um, for right now, uh, this is our last session uh, for the next couple or three weeks. But here we are, lesson six, dealing with the trials and the torture, the cross and conquering death. As usual, we're going to start off with a few uh, things to review, and uh, then we will um, share those uh, reviews, and then we will be off with your insights. So if you have any insights here in just a moment, be ready to go. All right, the life of Christ in review, all of these lessons. The main source are the gospel accounts, the story of Christ's life that was passed along to his followers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are sometimes referred to as A, the three kingdom gospels, the three synonymous gospels, the three synoptic gospels, or the three stylish gospels. What are Matthew, Mark, and Luke sometimes referred to as? Anybody? What? What number am I there? A, B, the three, synoptics. the three synoptic gospels. Number C is correct right there. Good job, Oscar. Thank you so much. And here we go to the next, uh, these synoptic gospels. Let me just kind of explain. That's the idea of to see together. In other words, they are seeing some of the same exact things that have happened, but seeing them at, in, in different perspectives and uh, kind of passing along the same stories from different people's viewpoint. The thought that Jesus possibly cleansed the temple twice in his lifetime, once early in his ministry and once late in his ministry. Is this idea true or false? Not the idea, but is it true that there are people that believe he cleansed the temple twice? Anyone? True. That is correct. And interestingly, as we shared with you guys the last couple of weeks, many scholars think that the cleansings took place in a place called Annas's Bazaar, which is the high priest that later helped sentence Jesus to death by Roman hands. So it's pretty uh, strange that Jesus would be right in the middle of Annas's Bazaar, turning over tables and things like that, and then soon uh, Annas would be the one uh, sending, sentencing him to be crucified. All right. What is a good working definition of a parable? A, that's any story that Jesus told because no one else ever told a single parable. B, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. C, a heavenly story with an earthly meaning. Or D, just a feel-good story, kind of like chip chicken soup for the disciple's soul. What is the answer here? What's a good working definition of a parable? Anyone? What's that? B. I don't know why I have my earbuds in my ears. I can now hear you. I heard somebody say B, and that is correct. Correct. It is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And wow, you guys all sound so much better. So it's good to have you. <laughs> all right. And if you guys remember last week, we started spoke a little bit about the transfiguration. This is a painting by Raphael from approximately 1520, but the word transfiguration comes from two words in Latin. One, trans, which means to change, and then figura, which means form or shape. And we talked about there's Peter, James, and John, the inner circle of the disciples up on the mountain, a very, very small mountain in this picture. Uh, but then we had uh, both uh, Moses and Elijah, and we went into the deep things there uh, on, on uh, Moses and Elijah and what might be a part of that. We also talked last week about The Chosen, the app that you can get and download and watch different parts of the story of Jesus reaching out to the disciples, calling them. And I just want to real, uh, really kind of emphasize that this is something that I've heard lots of really great things about. Shelly and I are planning on watching it. I've already got the app downloaded and all that. I encourage you to do the same if you are interested. All right. So the homework from lesson number five going into lesson six was to read Matthew chapters 26, 27, and 28 on the trials and torture, the cross and conquering death, and any observations that you guys might have, this is a chance for you to say, this is what jumped out to me, 
And uh, this is why uh, I enjoyed reading this passage. Anybody have something that jumped out to them that just really spoke to them from these verses and these chapters that we've shared? Anyone? So uh, Kendall and I were just discussing that um, we had not realized that at the moment of Jesus' death, the tombs, um, several other tombs had opened and several, it says several uh, believers who had fallen asleep were, were awakened and walked out of their tombs. And that was really fascinating to me. It's which is, I guess, one of those things that I missed over the years, you know, um, it's just real short. Oh, by the way, a bunch of people were raised from the dead. <laughs> it, it is it is kind of just thrown in there almost as an afterthought but you know where where jesus shows up there's miracles everywhere and so i'm sure it's hard to put them all in there but it is a really interesting thing i will let you kind of know that there are some people that believe that this um is kind of along the lines of something found in revelation where this is what they believe to be the first fruits uh, resurrection and that kind of thing. I wouldn't say that I necessarily agree or disagree. I haven't gone deep enough on that, but there are some people that do believe that, and it is something that they find interesting. But yes, it is also interesting to me in that section where these people come back to life and there's not anything that Jesus is doing. It's just almost like the power uh, is just being poured out and Things are happening because God's there in such an abundance. And it's just a beautiful reminder that uh, God is doing something there uh, in a powerful way. And he does it all different each and every time. It's really, really neat. Good stuff. Anybody else have something from Matthew 26, 27, or 28 that, that just jumped out to you in your reading? Anyone? Yeah, uh, I was reading in chapter 26 where uh, the women that uh, anointed uh, Jesus with a, with a flask of uh, uh, perfume. Yes. And um, they talk about uh, her uh, pouring it on, her, on his head. And then I think um, John says that uh, they, they, they put oil on on her on his feet, and then she brushed it with she dried him with with her hair. Yes. So, uh, and I was wondering uh, if if two things happened, you know? Yeah. They did her his his head and uh, anointing him for for the um, for his crucifixion and his death. This actually gets to a great point here, Oscar, and this is important <clears throat> to kind of know that sometimes when you read the synoptics or when you read um, John, there are never any of them claiming to be talking about every single thing that happened. And so sometimes when these things almost seem to disagree on the surface, Sometimes it's not really that they disagree. It's just that they're telling just one part, if that makes sense. It's almost like, you know, Shelly and I going on a vacation and, uh, you know, she had a great time. I had a great time. We come back, we start telling you about, you know, what part of the vacation that we enjoyed or most spoke to us or enjoyed the very most. It would be very different. It's not that the vacation didn't happen with both of those segments, but Shelly told from her perspective, I told from mine, and the totality of it gives us um, the, the fuller view, if that makes sense. But I definitely think that that's important to note, not just in this instance, but I bring it up as well, because if you read the, the resurrection account, some of them are like, well, what about that? And what about this? And what about this person showing up? None of them, say that they are trying to share the entirety of it they're just sharing a part and a piece and it's important to note that in a lot of different sections of the scriptures and and it gives me a good chance to kind of riff on that oscar so i appreciate uh the question and the observation is definitely a beautiful story um very good any other 
uh, observation, anything like that, that jumped out to any of you? Anyone? I think when Judah realized that he made a mistake, it said that he repented. And of course, he ended up killing himself, but, you know, he realized the guilt, you know, and I thought that was it kind of stood out to me. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty crazy thing. That whole part of the story is hard to kind of wrap your head around, but you can see, I guess the well, for one thing, the Jews absolutely abhorred suicide. And so because of that, you don't hear about it a lot. And I think that's part of why it just stands out so stark. Right, Frank? I mean, we don't hear about that kind of stuff about somebody killing themselves. It just rarely, rarely happens in the scriptures. And yet we know that it is something that does happen. Um, and Judas clearly realized that he had done wrong. I have all, always said and often said that, you know, the, the way to change when you regret what you have done is not to end it all at that point. It's to turn around and live to undo the things that you've done or to in some way make better the place that, you know, you've kind of turned your back on. And so I hate that Judas took that route, um, but yet sometimes it's too much and it was too much in his case for sure. Very interesting stuff. All right. Well, I tell you what, we're going to keep moving unless somebody else wants to jump in and say, hey, this is something I read that jumped out. I appreciate the insight, you guys, and I appreciate the just the conversation about what jumped out to you. Anyone else? One last shot for someone to share? Anyone? Going once, going twice. All right. Well, let me just say to you, if you are interested in going a little deeper on the great life that Jesus lived. This is the Great Lives from God's Word series by Chuck Swindoll. It's an amazing series. And this particular book that I did some uh, observations and some reading in uh, is called Jesus, The Greatest Life of All. And uh, this has to do with just detailing Jesus's story. And it is a powerful book as they all are. But if you wanna go a little deeper, definitely check that out. Those are available on audiobook, and they definitely are available for Amazon, just like everything else in the world. So if you want one, uh, grab one of those and uh, enjoy. All right. Well, off we go. We're going to be talking about the trials and the torture of Christ uh, first, and then we'll be talking about <clears throat> the cross and the conquering of death. Now, I just want to say I've got a lot of ground that I'm covering tonight, and so I will tell you I am more than happy to slow down and answer any question that you have. I will just say that I might offer a few less chances. You know how I'm normally, anybody have any questions? Anybody have anything that they want to share? What about this? What about that? I'm probably going to keep that to a minimum just because I've got a lot of ground to cover tonight. But I have always said, if you're interested in talking about something or something, there's a clarification needed, man, please jump in because that's what makes it a lot more enjoyable for everyone. So don't hesitate if that is the case. Off we go. The trials and the torture of Christ. The torture of Christ begins immediately as he's taken into custody. So as he's there in Gethsemane, they immediately begin to rough Jesus up for kind of a lack of a better term. And it may be just an indication of how far Christ had pushed them. And maybe his whole intention was to push them to the place where they would not let up on him until he was crucified um, by the Romans. And so he wouldn't ever let them off the hook. And they were determined that he would pay for all of the things that he had said about them and to them. And so in Matthew chapter 26, verse 47 is where we'll begin. <clears throat> While Jesus is still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrives. With him is a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. So going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. 
And then when the men stepped forward, they seized Jesus and arrested him. And with that, one of Jesus's companions reached for his sword, drew it out and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. One guess as to who that disciple was that did something before he thought about what he was doing. Just one guess is all you will need. And his name is what? Either Peter or Simon. <laughs> Simon Peter. Yes, absolutely. The guy who acts and then thinks, what did I just do? <laughs> the guy who says stuff and then says, what did I just say? Jesus rebukes him, says, put your sword back in its place. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? So Jesus is saying, I'm clearly here to give up my life, not to try to defend it and save it and then lose it at the end. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say that it has to happen in this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading in a rebellion that you've come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you didn't arrest me. But this is all happening to take place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples deserted him and fled. And then in chapter 26, verse 57, those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. I'm going to hit pause real quick. This is a perfect example of what we were talking about earlier. Jesus goes back and forth. He sees Herod. He sees Annas. He sees Caiaphas. He sees Pilate. He sees all of these different people in different succession at different times during the into the early, early hours of uh, that uh, Thursday evening into Friday morning, and then goes back and forth being shuttled all over. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, none of them are trying to give a total picture of every piece of what happened to him in his trials. So not everything that you know to be true is going to be listed here in Matthew. But I'm just letting you guys know this is a perfect example of what we were talking about. He's just giving what he feels that you need to know to get a sense of what he's trying to say. And so those who arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. Before Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest, he entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. And the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were there looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they didn't find any though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And then the high priest said, stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. And then the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah the son of God, you have said so. In other words, out of your own mouth, the truth has come, basically. That's what Jesus replies. But I say this to all of you, from now on, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes. He had an outer garment on, he tore it in a way of showing his extreme um, emotion at the moment. He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. So what do you think? He's talking to the leaders and the chief priests. And they all answer him, he's worthy of death. And then they spit in his face and strike him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Messiah. Who is it that hit you? So... I will just say, as we begin to talk a little bit about the trials and the torture of Christ, these things are bleeding into one. This is not exactly a trial where everybody's, uh, you know, kind of paying attention to the decorum of the courtroom. They are slapping and beating on Jesus. They have him probably in irons and probably his face is swollen from being beaten all the way back to Gethsemane. And so there's a lot going on here that just is so illegal, according to the laws that these men are supposed to be uh, holding up. 
some of them are along the lines of they are not ever to be having a, a court proceeding being held in a private residence. It just never happened. It is not supposed to happen that this happens at night. I've talked with you guys plenty of times about what a dark place, physically dark, things were there in the time of Christ and how it was hard to even get a sense of, you know, walking from house to house because the lights were so dim back then. And so as you begin to look at this, there's so much happening here that puts it in an illegal vein. One other thing that I'll mention before we move on is you were never supposed to ask a question of any defendant where they could self-incriminate. In other words, you couldn't ask somebody a direct question that if they answer the question, that they would be found guilty automatically. I don't know why that was the case, but that was the case. And he just flat out asked, are you or are you not the son of God? If Jesus answers yes, then he is clearly in their eyes, blaspheming, and he would be subject to death. Jesus does it anyway, knowing exactly what's going on and exactly what the question was designed to do. So a lot going on there in his trials. Any questions, thoughts, comments, anyone? Okay, well then let's keep moving, talking about the trials and the tortures of Christ. Chapter 27, verse 3, let's pick up there. When Judas, who betrayed him, this is the one that Frank was mentioning, he saw that Jesus was condemned. He was seized with remorse, returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I've sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money in the temple and left, and then he went away and hanged himself. And then the chief priest picked up the coins and said, it's against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. So that is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. And then what is spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set up on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Once more, we see this kind of reference where this is to take place so that it might be fulfilled what Jeremiah said or what was said in the prophets or what was said in the Old Testament scriptures. Roughly 68 times there are Old Testament references cited in the Gospel of Matthew. That's basically an average about two and a half times per chapter that Matthew is saying this is something that took place in Jesus's life that matches perfectly the prophecy that was made about him centuries and centuries before. And so this comes back to our purpose for Matthew's Gospel. I know it's a review time, and I know I've not got any multiple choice questions here up, but do any of you by chance remember what Matthew's purpose of his gospel was? Anyone? Kind of a tough question, but we've been talking about it for a few weeks. Maybe you might remember. Anyone? Get a quick drink anyway. What? that he was the messiah right that he was the one that was prophesied about absolutely that's right that was the reason for matthew's gospel that was the purpose of it and so he goes to great lengths to clearly share why jesus is and was the messiah and that's important all right the trials and tortures of jesus meanwhile jesus stood before the governor Pilate. the governor asked him are you the king of the jews you've said so out of your own mouth again and so when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. And Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony that they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not to a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. But now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. Anybody know what that festival was being held? It was the most important festival in the Jewish uh, calendar year. What was that? Do you know? Passover. Passover. That's right. That's right. And so it's the governor's customer at Passover 
to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. Fits right in with Passover, right? Having mercy. <laughs> At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. But what Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Such a fascinating thing that Pilate is being begged in his conscience and even by his conscience named his wife that uh, he was not supposed to do that. And yet he did anyway. So we go on and then Pilate asks this question. And this is what's very interesting. If you read this passage of scripture, you can tell that Pilate is desperately trying to release Jesus. He doesn't want to see him crucified. He knows that this is trumped up charges that Jesus is facing, and he's trying to get him to a place where he's got the freedom to walk away, even if he has to be beaten a little bit and roughed up a little bit so they have their pound of flesh, then at very least he'll be free and be taught the lesson that he needs to be taught, right? You can kind of see this all happening in their minds. But things turn quickly, and Pilate cannot find a way to wriggle off the hook that the chief priests and the leaders have put him on. And it's very important. We're going to talk very clearly in just a few moments about how important it is that Pilate is the one who does the crucifixion order and how that all came about and why it's so important. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Let's go further, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. In Matthew 27, 21, which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor to the people. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with the one who is called the Messiah or the king of the Jews? And they all answered, crucify him. And Pilate says, why? What crime has he committed? And that they all shouted all the louder, crucify him. So when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, <clears throat> but instead an uproar was starting, he took, a, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. And this is a powerful thing. I don't know if you guys caught this when you're reading it, but look at Matthew 27, 25. And then all the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. It's like, you don't know how deep what you just said really is. It's like they have a moment of speaking truth without even recognizing the truth that they're speaking about. But they say to Pilate, we're willing to have his blood on us. And that's the very reason that Jesus came in the first place. So he then released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Now, Christ faced one of the most brutal beatings, and it's often missed simply because it's summed up in a short sentence. But then he had Jesus flogged. That's it. That's all that it says. But let's go a little deeper here. According to a modern doctor, a flogging usually was done by an expert who used a whip with small metal weights at the end of the, the leather tongs. So it was, a, it was probably a stick that had leather straps trailing off of it, not a single, but a number of them. And they would have small metal weights at the end of that. So it wouldn't just lay on, but it would lay heavily on there. And sometimes if they were especially um, psychopathic, I don't know, it's maybe the only word that I can think of. If they were especially psychopathic, they would braid bits of sheep's bones into the leather. And so they would have glass or sheep's bones in there and lay a stripe on an individual and then draw it back. And they would just be tearing chunks of flesh off of the bodies of the people that they were whipping. 
it is a flogging it's summed up in literally like a, a four word, you know, he had Jesus flogged, but what that meant to Jesus's physical strength and his ability, uh, you know, to get up and down the hill and all the various things, it was absolutely critical. It just changed everything for him. And so I just want to kind of go a little deeper. According to this modern doctor, uh, the flogging, we need to also note that this wasn't 39 lashes, the 40 lashes minus one that was in the Jewish law. That was the Jewish law. No Roman cared at all about being a person who observed the Jewish law. And especially if they were beating on a, a person that wasn't even their own countrymen, they would not do this to a Roman. They had no qualms whatsoever about doing this to a man who was a, a Jew. This beating, this flogging would expose deep muscle, reaching often even all the way to the bones. It usually induced shock for the victim within minutes, often making them lose consciousness. But before the beating would continue, they would make sure that they would regain their consciousness. So every single lash that they took was one that they were conscious of and felt. It's crazy. Man, life was cheap back then, y'all. It was so cheap. And uh, it's just so disturbing, really. These floggings often cracked ribs, bruised tissue deep. It would bruise a person's lung. Many times would cause their lungs to collapse and or fill with blood. And those of you who have looked at and studied and listened closely, I've already covered this in sermons before, but Jesus died probably by asphyxiation with his lungs full of, of blood because of all the trauma that he had endured. And he just simply couldn't get a breath anymore. And so he probably just died because of that reason. And this is probably where it began, all summed up in he had Jesus flogged. And that's it. So don't miss the, the trauma that Jesus endured um, at that point. All right. Any questions or comments before we go any further? I know it's kind of a disturbing conversation. Um, a lot to learn, though. A lot, a lot that Jesus went through for us. Anyone? <clears throat> I really am getting a drink because I need a drink. But you do have just a brief moment. If you have a question. All right. I guess I probably shouldn't try to eat ice and speak at the same time. Let's keep moving. <laughs> Let's move on to the cross and conquering death. Christ is going to be crucified, a Roman method of death that puts him squarely on the path to fulfill numerous scripture passages from the Psalms. Now, Let's talk about capital punishment. If you go into the passage of scripture in John, we're covering Matthew. We're not trying to cover everything. And in John, there's a back and forth between the chief priest and between Pilate and them. And as he talks to them, he says, you take him and crucify him by your own law. And they say to him, but we can't. You Romans, when you came in here and took all of our power away and put all you puppet governors in place, you took away our ability as the Sanhedrin to prescribe anybody to be capital punished or killed. You decided that you were going to be the ones who put anybody to death if it was going to happen. Otherwise, it was a problem. You guys understand the back and forth that they're not saying, but that's what's going on. So you guys tell me, Go back into your Sunday school uh, days. What was capital punishment and how was it carried out in the Jewish, uh, in the Jewish circles? You remember? Stoning. Stoning. Exactly. But there is a scripture passage that says not one of his bones will be broken. Let me ask you a question. If you are going to be stoned to death, what do you figure the likelihood of somebody breaking a bone would be? I'd say fairly high, right? <laughs> He's probably going to bake multiple, multiple bones, just incredible trauma to the body from top to bottom. Well, he is facing something else 
but it is not the Jewish way. And so even though the chief priests and the Pharisees are the driving force of it, it's going to be carried out by the Romans. And that's really important because the Romans do it in ways that fulfill scripture after scripture after scripture about what Jesus will face as he is crucified. For example, he, he cries out, you know, the words from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is a passage of scripture straight from the Psalms. They cast lots for my clothing. It's exactly what they did while Jesus was hanging on that cross. Not one of his bones will be broken and they will look on the one that they have pierced. Well, how do you pierce someone if you've stoned them, it's basically a bunch of blunt force trauma from head to toe. But if you're piercing somebody with a javelin in the side or piercing somebody with nails in the hands or the wrists or in the feet, they're looking on the one that they have pierced. Jesus fulfilling scripture after scripture after scripture by these people killing him according to the Roman way, not the Jewish way. And they have pierced my hands and feet, written by David all the way back about 1050 BC and taking place with Jesus at about 30 AD. It's incredible, really. All right. So the cross and conquering death, Matthew 27. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. I put this little sign here because we're going to talk a little bit about him carrying the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. We're also going to say a few words about that. They offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. There's so much going on in these passages. What's going on here is, is that oftentimes they would offer a strong wine with gall in there to dull the pain and the senses. Jesus tasted that, realized what it was, and would not drink it. Do you understand? He would not take any anesthesia, so he would be fully present physically, emotionally, spiritually. So as he's hanging there, dealing with a death that we can't even hardly wrap our heads around without getting a little sick to our stomach, he says, I'm going to take it all, and I don't need any pain meds, any dulling of the pain, any dulling of the senses. I'm here for this, and I'm 100% here for this. It's, just cre it's incredible, really. It's so powerful. When they crucified him, they divided up his uh, clothing by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And then from noon until about three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sambachthani, which in Aramaic means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see all those passages of scripture we already alluded to? It's all happening. So let's take a couple of looks at some things here very quickly. You've seen this picture and this image of Jesus carrying a cross. The likelihood here is, is that Jesus probably did not carry the full cross. He probably carried the cross beam of the cross. Because often, as you see in this illustration here, they would tie ropes. They would tie ropes to the man who is carrying the cross beam. Now, don't get me wrong, that cross beam probably was something akin to like a railroad tie. And I mean, I've done work with railroad ties. I mean, these things are huge and they are incredibly heavy, much less when you have been beaten to within inches of your life. And I mean, quite literally within inches of your life. And then they would probably have this beam attached to this beam and then either stand it up and then shove it or drop it into the hole or they would lift it up on in one piece it could be either one um, but there is a possibility that it probably although all the artwork that we have seen has depicted this as being a full cross that he is carrying it probably was just the cross beam this is an image of simon of cyrene 
and Jesus carrying the load together, which I think is probably something that would have happened. If you go back and think about the flogging that Jesus had just endured, he needed help, I'm sure, being supported. And whether Simon carried the entirety of the cross or Jesus carried it some and Simon helped him or Jesus had it on his back and Simon kind of drug him up the hill, I don't know. One other thing that I want to mention to you is if you notice in this passage of scripture, they say above his head, they place the written charge against him. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. In five myths about the cross published in the Washington Post online, it says that it was likely this kind of a T cross where it was, you know, Jesus's arms here and nothing above his head. But that doesn't jive with what scripture says. More than likely, it was more of this kind of cross where there was room to have a, a placard placed above it like this, but it was probably in two pieces initially and then, you know, spliced together. This is called the uh, patil patibulum, and this is called the stipes, and that's the upright and then the horizontal. One other thing here is that if you see this little platform here, you would often have uh, a person have their feet nailed to the cross, but that platform was there so that the people could put their weight on their feet and then lift themselves up. Because what was going on is all of the weight of a person's chest and body is pushing down on them and they are having a struggle to catch a breath. If they had that platform, they could raise themselves up just enough where they could draw a breath and then relax and come down. But the problem was, was all that that did would just simply be to extend a person's life who really was begging for death. And so this is, the torture device is insane. I mean, it is just deeply disturbing what humans can do to other humans. But this is what's going on. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of that and a little bit of my two cents on what I believe the scriptures teach us and, you know, kind of the reality of it. Any questions or comments? I kind of tackled a couple of things that you might not have thought about. Give you an opportunity for a question or a comment. Anyone? <clears throat> well, let's talk very quickly about Golgotha or Golgotha, the place of the skull. Here's a modern picture mixed with an older picture. Check this out. This is more than likely Calvary's Hill or Golgotha. And as you can kind of look a little closer, you can see the eyes here and here. If you look closely, this is an older image of the eye and the eye and the nose and the forehead here on this modern. And just be very clear, this is a Wikipedia image if you search for Golgotha the place of the skull it was probably called place of the skull for a couple of reasons one lots of skulls were created there because of all the murders that took place on on that hill but this is an older image you can see another older image you can see how easily you can call this the the place of the skull but check this out this modern this modern stuff always blows my mind because you can see the image that they've taken. This is an image that they've taken as well. But you can see the modern tour buses here and it's turned into a parking lot. Um, this is just the reality. This is near the place, what they call the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Israel. But this is likely Golgotha, the place of the skull. And you can kind of see that. Uh, so I just wanted to share that if you wondered what that was all about. Now, you know. All right. So when some of those heard Jesus say, Eli, Eli, lama sambachthani, they thought he's calling Elijah. So immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. And then the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And that's important that it's top to bottom. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. This is what Eric was speaking about. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. 
And then when the centurion, that's the Roman guard, who was not a Jew, and those with him were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. And then in chapter 27, verse 57, as evening approached, there came a man from Arimathea, a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus's body. and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. And he rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb, and then he went away. And then this Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting opposite the tomb. And the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was alive, that deceiver said that after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until that third day. Otherwise, his disciples will come and steal a body and tell people that he'd been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. And so they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. You guys know what the seal is probably uh, like? Anybody know what the, what about a seal from back in the days of King Arthur and all that stuff? You guys know anything like, like that? What was a seal back then? It was his ring, right? And he would seal it in wax to authenticate a document. Exactly. That's right. And so oftentimes you would pour wax uh, over maybe this big of an area, not that big of an area, I guess. And then you would, uh, while the, while the uh, wax was still warm, he would take his signet ring and he would press it into the wax. This is probably something that happened on a much larger scale. The seal around the, the stone that covered the tomb. If you were found to be messing with that, you could be either imprisoned or killed, just depending on the mood of the guards at that time, probably. And so they put a seal on the tomb of Jesus to keep him, um, to keep his disciples out. Uh, but it still couldn't keep him in, right? Amen. So uh, the truth is, is that uh, the seal was just there to prove that they took measures, but it wasn't enough. All right. Any questions, thoughts, or comments before we talk about the, the tomb and, and his resurrection? Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Yes, so um, I was wondering, Joseph of Arimathea, um, he cut out um, his own tomb. Is it that he was into the business of building tombs or how did he know that, okay, Jesus was going to die and he already had the tomb ready for him? So I think what that was, was what they would normally do is they would either build a tomb or use an existing cave. And, and so what he probably had done at that time is he had either purchased one or had one, but since it was so late in the day when Jesus uh, was declared to be dead and taken off the cross, they were getting close to sundown and the Sabbath begins at sundown. And so they were in a big hurry. They couldn't take him far away. They said, we got to get a tomb close but we don't want his body hanging on this cross any longer than it has to be so they took him to the nearest tomb and that was the one that a rich man had joseph of arimathea who was originally a part of the sanhedrin who began to believe in jesus over a sh over a long period of time same with nicodemus and they put him in a rich person's tomb even though he had been killed with common criminals so um, more than likely, it was something that he had had built or already existed for the purpose of a tomb, probably for himself and his family. And it just happened to be that it was perfect for Jesus, and especially that close to Golgotha. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Very good. Okay. 
as I said, you guys can definitely interrupt if you got any questions. Otherwise, I'm going to keep moving. Matthew 28, 1. After the Sabbath, what is the Sabbath if you're a Jew? You remember? Isn't it Saturday? It is. That's right. And so don't forget that when it says after Saturday, dawn on the first day of the week, that's why we as Christians celebrate Christ and his resurrection on the first day of the week, Sunday, right? Not Saturday. You go to the Jewish part of the world, they don't have stuff closed down on Sunday. They have it closed down on Saturday because they still celebrate Sabbath according to their Old Testament law, right? So just be aware that when you hear Sabbath, we celebrate the Christian Sabbath, not the Jewish one. Okay, so after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples, he's risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy. And they ran to tell his disciples, but suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him. They clasped his feet and worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee where they will see me. And so this is the, the things happening on the first day of the week. This stone is probably not six foot tall and perfectly circular and just this deep, you know, as you have kind of seen it in all of the depictions. And I continue to see it in depictions. It was probably like a normal cave, maybe a hole in the ground that went down into an open area a cavity, and you saw the, the Golgotha's hill, it was probably something similar to that type. Those eyes were probably cave entrances or something along those lines, cavities in the rock. And that stone was probably something that just fell over and lay deep into almost like a, a, a bowl area to keep that. The reason that they did that was to keep the wild animals out and the smell in just to be very blunt about it, but that's what they're doing. They're trying to keep the smell in. That's also why they prepare Jesus's body with burial spices. They would take strips of linen cloth and wrap it around his body and hold those strips of linen cloth together with a, a, a myrrh or an alabaster perfume so strong that it would overwhelm the decay smell. And it was from head to toe. It was almost like a mummification, probably ending about right here with a different setup on his face. You guys with me? Okay, let's keep reading. So while the women were on their way to Galilee, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that happened. When the chief priest met with the elders, devised a plan, gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you're to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away when we were asleep. I just have one question. If you were asleep, how do you know who came during the night and stole him away? I'm just curious, just a curious question. I guess they were sleeping with one eye open, which is what my wife claims that she's able to do ever since she gave birth. But I don't know if I believe them and I don't believe her either, but that's okay. All right. In Matthew 28, 14. This report gets to the governor. We'll satisfy him, keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And as this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. But here's a couple of things that we need to grasp and get. Some proofs of the resurrection. If you are producing first witnesses to the resurrection, if you're trying to begin a movement, Ladies, I don't mean this in any offensive way at all. I promise you, I do not. But you would never, ever choose a woman 
in first century Palestine to be your first witnesses to see Jesus and say, well, who saw Jesus as this resurrected Messiah? Well, those two women over there did because there were men who were so sexist at that moment that it, it literally took two women to have one truth. That, that's how bad it was as far as sexism goes. They literally required two women to share the same exact story in a court of law for it to be accepted as true. Now, we've come a long way. We still have places to go. But this is never what you would do if you were trying to set it up and say, this will help everybody to know that Jesus was the Messiah. But here's the problem. Sometimes truth gets in the way of what you would prefer to do, right? The truth is, is that these women were there first. They saw that Jesus was resurrected first. And so guess what the gospel accounts said? These two women were the first. They didn't change the story. And by the way, what an incredible honor. These women who had been following Jesus from day one, supporting his ministry financially so that he could give all of his time to teaching and preaching the gospel and go wherever he went, they were gifted as the ones, not James, not Peter, not John, none of them, the women who literally were in the background all the time, all the time with Jesus, were the first ones to see and be told about the resurrection. What an incredible honor that was. So cool. Roman seals were trifled with at the threat of death. And so when they sealed the tomb, if you trifled with that, you could be put to death. Also, falling asleep on an overnight watch also could result in a death sentence. If you were on a serious watch and you fell asleep, you could be paying with your life. And so these men who supposedly fell asleep in the middle of the watch and this seal that was broken because his disciples came, they never killed anybody for it. It just was let alone. Why is that? Why is it handled so much different than every other time? And if the chief priest had taken the body so it wouldn't become a shrine later on, all they had to do was simply produce the body of Christ and every bit of this stuff about resurrection ends, but they never did. And then the most powerful thing to me is this. Why would you and all 10 of your closest friends all endure extreme torture and death for a lie that every one of you knew was a lie? Especially if it's there at the very end of your life and you say, you know what? I got nothing to gain. I'm about to die. All I have to do is recant, but not a single one of them did. Why? Because they believed with all of their heart to the point of being tortured just as much as Jesus was. As a matter of fact, Peter was crucified upside down on a cross because he said, I am not worthy to be crucified in the same way that my Lord was. Crucify me upside down, head down, feet up, so that I am crucified on a cross, but not in the same way as Christ. He's in a whole different league than me. But yet he did that. Why? <laughs> because that's what he believed with all of his heart. The short answer, you wouldn't go to those extremes. Somebody in the chain would break. The problem with conspiracies is it's made up of people, and people always talk. People always let it slip where they really believe. And the true truth always tends to come out because nobody can keep their mouth shut. Well, everybody kept the same story. 10 of the 11 died brutal deaths, all declaring to the very end that Jesus had resurrected and appeared to them. And I would just say this, he's changed lives and changed hearts and changed minds for millennia now. And even if they did not go to the death believing that, although well, they did, but I can tell you that in my life, and I know that probably you can tell me in your life that Jesus has changed everything when nothing else would change anything, you know? And that's a powerful statement about the power of Jesus Christ. Now, very quickly, in 2816, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some even doubted. That's probably the doubting Thomas. But then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What is this called? It's called the what? The Great Commission. The Great Commission. Very good. That's right. It's the Great Commission. This is our marching orders until he comes back and changes them. We're supposed to be teaching people about the power and the change that Jesus Christ can bring in their life. Very quickly, here's your big takeaway from all of the lessons, the whole thing. Matthew wrote about how Jesus was the Messiah, how he was God's son, how he fulfilled prophecy, and how he was God in the flesh. Jesus showed himself to his disciples, who were the cornerstones of the church. He died, conquered death so we could live without fear of death or condemnation from God. And he, and he alone is our Lord, and he is our Savior. It's Jesus, and it's all about him. The final thing that I want to just share with you again is if you'd like to go a little deeper in any of these uh, stories, have inspired you to know more about Christ, this is available, whether it's audio book or anything, and it is definitely, definitely worth your time. All right, so any questions, thoughts, or comments as we close out our Life of Christ Bible study. Anybody have anything? I have a question. Um, sure. I thought when the ladies left the tomb that they thought he was the gardener at first. It didn't really say that here. And again, I would say in that instance, just in that same way, perspective from one to the other, not trying to cover every bit or piece, but probably the truth you know how that goes. You're telling a story. And you're like, I'm going to be honest with you. What, what I really thought was that I thought he was the gardener initially, you know? And so that, that's probably what I would say about that. But yes, especially in John, I believe it refers to that, that Mary thought he was the gardener. Good observation. Good stuff. Any other questions, comments, thoughts, any capstone thoughts about this uh, study or anything that you guys might have? As we end, I don't want to linger too long, but maybe you've got a comment or a thought. Anyone? Um, Randy, what, what do theologians believe about how, for example, you know, the ladies were there at the tomb and none of the disciples were the capital disciples? Um, how did they know to write stuff down? You know, was, did they all just confab on this stuff later? you know, and discuss it. Hey, what did you see? What happened? You know, write it down later, um, you know, maybe like, you know, a couple days later, or, you know, what's, what's the thought on how they, how he knows the stuff where he wasn't there. Absolutely. Well, I would say that one is, is that this stuff is all led by the Holy spirit later on, but I would also just on the practical side, just remind you that the truth is, is that we think of things and we write stuff down because, Oh, we're, Where's a pen? Oh, I literally, I literally have a pen in my pocket right now, right here. All right. Back then you never had paper. You never had pen. You never had anywhere and anything to write it down. So you just had to use your memory. And so for years, what they would do is they would verbally tell. And for centuries and centuries, stuff was passed down for people who couldn't read had no writing instruments. It was always verbal. And that's the same thing that happened in the case of the Gospels, that the verbal and oral tradition went from one to one to one to one and finally came to the place where somebody said, you know what, we're going to write this down and we're going to do this with paper and ink. And it's not that they didn't have it, but the common ordinary man did not have access to that stuff. They couldn't send themselves a text or write an email or put it in the computer the way we do. And in some ways, I mean, let's be honest, let's be honest, we're, some of us are old heads here. Um, you used to remember the phone numbers. You had eight or 10 or 12 of them memorized, right? And now you don't have three of them memorized. Well, I do memorize 911. That's the only one I've got. But the reason I have that is because I've got it, one number that I got to press, or I just got to tell Siri to call somebody. And so our brains have become untrained in that where theirs were finely tuned to remember those things and tell them the same way over and over and over again. 
I don't know if that makes sense, but that was stories. That was Bible stories. That was oral tradition. That was teachings. That was songs. It was all the same. And it was all right up here. I hope that answers the question. Chosen does a good, it, it did. Thank you. The chosen did, does a good job. They show Matthew a lot and he, he pulls out his little thing all the time. He's like, Oh, let me remember this. This is an, like when something miraculous happens, they all watch it with their jaw on the floor. Yeah. And then later, Oh, and he pulls out this tablet of paper and a you know a, a pen and such or a pencil or something and starts yeah. writing it down. So and with, really cool. I'm sorry, I did not mean to interrupt. And and with Matthew, I could easily see that because he was the tax collector making money off of all of the poor people before he became the follower. It's good. It's good. So they, they they actually depict him as kind of a person who pays attention to very fine details in the show so it works for the fact that his gospel is written this way it would make sense to uh, an accountant is the person that wants to know where that last penny went right it makes perfect sense so they probably cast him correctly that's very, that's very cool all right any other questions or thoughts or comments any any last minute or overarching thoughts on the the study i hope you guys have enjoyed it as much as i've enjoyed like presenting it to you. There's just so much. I know we've covered a ton of ground so quickly, but hopefully it's been good. Yes, ma'am, Miss Miss Monica. So I'm um, sorry, I have one question. Um, I think in chapter 27, when the graves were opened and the dead arrows and appeared in the city, did they appear as ghosts or um, they went back to the grave after? When Jesus died on the cross and um, there was an earthquake, <laughs> Okay. And, um, and the graves are opened. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to give you the prize for the toughest question for me tonight. I, that's a tough one. Here's what I will say. I will <laughs> reserve the right to go back and change this later, but here's what I would say. I believe that they probably came out as ghosts, as spirits that were disembodied, because I believe that part of what Christ did that was different than all others was not that there was a spirit that appeared, but there was a body that could be handled. There was a, a body that could eat fish, that could touch people and say, here, put your hands in the, in the nail prints in my hands, touch into my side and see that I am not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. I'm the real body of the real Jesus, just glorified. And so I would say that the likelihood is, is that they had appeared as spirits. And eventually, when all of us receive our glorified bodies, there will be a glorification, a raising from the dust and the dirt that we have all been returned to will be put back and reconstituted as a body. I know that sounds like superhero stuff, but hey, talk to God. That's what I think he is saying in his word. All right. So I think that's probably my answer. And I think that they probably did go back. I think what pro uh, probably was trying to be done here is that God's trying to tell people who are paying attention, I'm doing something different and out of the ordinary. The tearing of the temple curtain from top to bottom was a big deal. That was stage curtains on Broadway. That was not, you know, the veil of a bride, you know, hanging on a wall somewhere. That was a serious, serious thing that happened. And the body's obviously incredible. So I think those are, that's my answer on that question. I hope it, I hope it helps. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, hey, there's your sticker for the toughest question of the night. So enjoy. All right. Anybody else? Don't you dare try to stump me. You can just ask a regular question. You don't have to try to stump me. I'll give you a sticker for whatever reason. <laughs> Anyone? Well, guys, we've gone a little long as we brought this to a close. I appreciate so much your time and your attention. It's been a blessing to go through the life of Christ with you. And uh, thanks for taking that time for being involved. I will be doing another lesson and study before too long, um, maybe shorter durations, you know, three or four weeks, and then another couple of weeks off, just depending on the summer month. But stay with it and stay with us as we go through these things. I think it'll be a blessing to you. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Tell you guys, thank you so much for joining. May God bless you, and I'll see you on Sunday, okay? Good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. I'll take care.
Randy, are you still on? I am. I have a question for you. What? Okay. No, no, I don't no, know no. I, have I, I had to look at all the ugly side of that phone call. Look, look at you <laughs> I was here. And then here you are, the pretty side of the phone call. You're not even on there. I'm very frustrated, <laughs> very angry about that. <laughs> okay. Hold on. Please tell I me I stopped sharing that. About oh, no. Randy. 